good, uh, good evening, good evening all. And thank you for, for inviting me. Thank you for joining uh, to, to you all. And a special thank to Mareth, Johan, Chris uh, and Michele that in several ways uh, uh, helped me to, to be here and, uh, and invite me and made me feel very, very comfortable in this, uh, in this room, in this virtual room, but very, very warm room. Thank you so much all. Um, I will now um, share my my screen, and while I, I'll share it, I'll I like to, to to introduce what what I'm going to say for in the last in the next uh, I don't know 40 minutes or or so um, by yeah describing a little bit why I I I decided to talk about the, the, these things so that have very much to do with what I do in my my day uh, during my days here at the museum, and so. What I'm going to do is not, not obviously a comprehensive uh, uh, description, uh, discussion, um, um, uh, discussion on what the Anthropocene is, uh, on what, uh, on how many roads uh, and uh, complex uh, um, uh, crossroads uh, uh, life experienced in the last. Uh, Four billion years, more or less. That, or more or less, that would be the description, or actually the the real meaning of what is in the title. But I would like to share a number of stories that have to do with what I I do. So from my approach, my point of view on these two main main topics. So starting from something that had to do with uh, in uh, focusing on specific times. Uh, the one in which I have a little bit more experience, let's say, and how this perspective from the deep time um, uh, are helping me to develop uh, a point of view on the Anthropocene, obviously providing some uh, hints of what the Anthropocene is. And the second part of the title has to do with uh, the idea that in these in this, uh, this 40 minutes, we will go putting together uh, elements, data, and, uh, and evidences that are from, from the field. So from forests, from uh, especially rocks, uh, since I'm a paleontologist by training, but have also to do, and toward the last part of the talk, we will go into that, uh, in, 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 in the way in which we preserve biodiversity in, in our museums. So I will try to put all this, all this together. Um, you will see there is maybe not much about conservation, although and uh, maybe I, I am supposed to talk about conservation, but maybe it's the more, more general uh, field, the more general, um, let's say, the landscape in which it makes sense to work on conservation that will be on tonight in my, in my talk. So I'm, I'm a paleontologist by training, and maybe many of you are not that, that uh, um, uh, comfortable with, with the, 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 the work, the approach of a paleontologist. So I devoted the first slide just to present uh, the way in which I see the world, the way in which we see the world, the world as paleontologists. So I, I take here, uh, uh, and, and with a little editing, uh, a sentence from one of my favorite, favorite books that is from Heinrich Boll, a uh, Nobel uh, laureate, uh, uh, The Crown. In, wrote in 1963, in which he's talking about the clown, that is the, 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 the main uh, um, character of, of his novel. Uh, but I'm, I'm doing the, the clown in this moment, uh, moving uh, his, uh, his metaphor to the one of the paleontology, that exactly like his clown, who is alive only when he's on stage, uh, paleontologists collect moments and are alive only in certain, in certain times. I, I want to say that as, mm, uh, what I want to say is that using the words of uh, uh, Charles Darwin, unfortunately, paleontologists cannot just describe the history of life, uh, uh, telling it from uh, day by day. We don't have this uh, resolution of data for the past. We have only few times here and there recorded by rocks uh, and recorded by fossils. And only these times, these little moments in times are those in which we are alive, in which we can say something. And the, one of the major um, uh, tasks of, uh, of a paleontologist is to connect these little moments, these little frames, these little pictures through time to tell, to narrate the history of life. That is absolutely not at all completely recorded in the rocks, in the books. And Charles Darwin was very clear on this. He, he maybe was a little bit too pessimistic 
on the way on, on how we can and how much we can tell about the history of life. But he described this very well in this very famously in this in this uh, long um, with using this metaphor of of of, of an encyclopedia of uh, a number of books that are the whole history of life of which we lost a number where we lost a number of these books and of the books that remained that are those that are in the rocks, let's say, uh, we lost a number of pages and then a number of lines. So we have only words here and there of this long history and we have, but we want to tell the whole story. So what we do as paleontologists is to continuously zoom in and zoom out from the history of life. We look at single moments, single events, single species that were doing something in the history of life. We are, we are lucky enough to have the fossils, to have the data on which we can describe what they were doing, where they were living, how they, they were acting with other organisms, in which environments in their history of life, maybe for a single moment in time. And then we zoom out and we try to see how those events, those uh, characters, uh, those subjects, uh, those uh, organisms in, the, in that specific moment have to do with the whole history, trying to reconstruct this, this huge uh, deep time that is just behind uh, our, our shoulders. And in doing so, uh, I especially focused in, in the last 10 years, more or less, on mass extinctions. Mass extinctions are those catastrophic events in which biodiversity dramatically drops very fast in geological terms. This means, in most of the times, this means, most of the times, this means uh, thousands of years, or maybe hundreds of thousands of years. So uh, quick in geological terms, in geological, uh, in, the, in the, the world of geology is not obviously the quick of our days, of our day life, uh, of human day life. But nevertheless, this is very fast in comparison with the length of uh, the geological time. And in and, and the, the, the graph that you see now on, on the screen is kind of uh, our big summary of the history of life. So on the horizontal axis, Acts, you have the time that is flowing from the deep time to your left to now that it's to the right. So those are the millions of years uh, of life behind our shoulders. You see uh, an elephant to the right today, and then uh, stranger and stranger beasts uh, to, um, to, the, to the left. And in the vertical axis is an, a, an index, uh, any index uh, of biodiversity. So the diversity of life measured, here is measured in families because Paleontologists generally do that using families, but you can use any index you, you, you wish. Uh, species, uh, uh, morphological diversity, you can use uh, genetic distance and any, any, any measure you want to use. And if you see this red line, this is not a flat, um, a flat line, this is not a continuous increase, but it's a continuously up and down uh, a curve that the curve that demonstrates that the, during the history of life, biodiversity has shifted through very lucky times in which biodiversity was increasing and very hard times in which biodiversity was even very fast, even dramatically, even very rapidly collapsing. And the uh, five points, let's say, the one to the to the starting from the light uh, from the left uh, that you see highlighted with those those uh, five points on, in red are those that we generally call mass extinctions in, in events. So those where the magnitude of the extinction was so high to to go in all these four uh, instances go over seventy five percent. So seventy five percent of the biodiversity alive before the event uh, got extinct during the event and so did not survive. In the in the in the life flowing after the the event, so I focused on on this extinction, and maybe most of these uh, are completely unknown to the general public, but some are in, in really uh, famous, really popular. Like for example, the extinction that is going to happen in a second on this uh, little reconstruction, as you see, a meteorite is is eating uh, our planet, and this is the famous so-called dinosaur extinction that happened about 66 million years ago. So this is the kind of events uh, I've been studying in the last uh, uh, 10 years, and the uh, the general idea is that you cannot study this event if you don't study fossils. There is there is no other way in which you can understand these events uh, if uh, you don't have fossils, if you don't study fossils. And I, I, I like this, this, uh, this quote from uh, a, a very 
famous uh, um, French composer, Hector Berlioz, uh, who said, the time is the best teacher. Unfortunately, it kills all its students. As time passes, obviously, there is no past. Uh, there is no presence. Is, there is, all, uh, there is uh, um, this, this continue, uh, continue con time is, is continually destroying what is, what is uh, uh, doing. Uh, how when it, it is it is moving on, and this is very clear and very and very how to say uh, nominal for fossils that are exactly that they are killed um, um, uh, testify uh, um, proves uh, no? uh, data from from the past that have been um, over overwritten by by time, and so you th this is the, the 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 our material. This is these are the clues. This is the, the evidences that we use to uh, reconstruct this, this, this huge story, of which I will tell you a, a few bits. Uh, as, you, as you can imagine, the life of the past is obviously the life of present. It's just uh, is the, is the same flowing of life through time that is tightly connected with, with the present. Actually, we are the result of millions of year, years of, uh, of, uh, um, of diversification of life. And we can connect, easily connect, present and past life using phylogenies. So reconstructing the evolutionary relationships that link past and present uh, uh, organisms, any kind of organism. So obviously we can build our, our trees of life. We are, we are we, our gigantic uh, description of uh, the relatedness of life using both uh, um, living evidences, so living animals or plants, uh, and fossils that we can uh, put in the same trees, uh, de de describing the same huge family of life diversificating through, through time. And, but we can also describe environments, uh, and therefore putting together, uh, mostly with the, using data from, from rocks, and so putting together the data from, let's say, geologists, so the one that have to do more with the composition of the rocks and for the environments in which the rocks formed, together with our understanding of the organisms that live in the past, we can re reconstruct ecosystems from the past and then depict them maybe, as you can see in this, uh, uh, in this uh, um, artwork here on, on the screen. Uh, I'm lucky enough to live in a place where we have a lot of mountains uh, and sedimentary rocks, and this means we have a lot of strata that we can uh, dig into to look for fossils and rocks and reconstruct uh, the past. These that you see are the Dolomites Mountains in, in northern Italy. And they are very, very nice to study because the, uh, they, are, they have been studied in the last uh, uh, 300 years, more or less, so that we have now a very good understanding of the single environments, the very, um, the very detailed environments that all the rocks represent in, in our mountains. And therefore, for example, here, you can see that just looking at the mountain and having studied the rocks, we can see how the environments of the past are now represented in the rocks. And so when we go there and look for fossils, uh, we know which kind of environment we, we should expect. And so therefore uh, we are very, um, it's, it, our, our job become very, very much easier because uh, we know the context in which uh, uh, the organism that we want to study lived in, in the past. And one of the studies we did in, in, the, last, in the last years uh, was in that gorge, uh, in this gorge that you see in this, in this picture, uh, that is called the Blätterbach Gorge. Uh, and all the, the layers that you see that here in red are layers, uh, are rocks, uh, strata that uh, um, are uh, documenting a, a transition through one of these great mass extinction, and in particular the one, the, the so-called mother of all extinctions, the, the deepest extinction, the one that extinct more or less 90, 95 percent of life uh, that, that occurred about 252 million years ago. So we went there to study the rocks to try to understand what was happening in this catastrophic perturbation in this time in which. Uh, uh, life completely changed uh, its, uh, its components, so the species, but also the relationship between the species that we know that is actually the most important thing through life because relationships keep going through uh, history, whereas uh, species uh, come and go as individuals come, come and go. And therefore we were there 
uh, trying to look for evidences of, of this extinction. And actually looking at rocks here at 46 uh, degrees of latitude north, uh, northern Italy, we are actually looking at a tropical environment because 252 million years ago, what is now northern Italy was actually where um, the equatorial area is now. Uh, and so it's like if we were jumping in, in Africa, actually looking at, at these rocks uh, compared to today. And what we were studying, we have been studying there are little plants uh, with uh, even insect damage uh, traces. So we look also at how um, these plants were interacting with uh, the whole ecosystem there, for example, with insects that were predating, uh, pu uh, putting their eggs and so on on these plants. We were looking at traces, uh, tracks, uh, footprints, but also skeletal bones of reptiles with the aim of reconstructing the whole environment, an environment that was going through a perturbation, one of the largest perturbations that one can think of, the perturbation that occur on ecosystems during mass extinctions. So what was happening to biodiversity at that, at that time? We reconstructed the environment at the time, so we knew exactly what kind of um, environment, what kind of processes, uh, environmental processes were going on at that time there. So this is more or less how Northern Italy appeared uh, at that time. And, and this is uh, what more or less came, came out uh, from, from our study. So we reconstructed all the single organisms that lived there and uh, their, their reconstruction. So um, uh, primary pro producers, secondary producers, uh, uh, top carnivores, uh, uh, temperature of the air and so on. All these things can be uh, reconstructed by studying in details of uh, obviously this, uh, this event. And what turned out that I think it's, it's relevant uh, in this context is that a number of processes were going on that we will tackle in, we'll tackle in a second. But one thing that um, uh, occurred during this mass extinction event that you will, will not be able to understand from, uh, from this graph, but I will try to explain it is that during this, this mass extinction event, one thing that was uh, killed, killed during this dramatic event, this dramatic perturbation that had, had obviously to do with a, a, a rapid climate change, the phase of climate change that then brought biodiversity into crisis, is that the so-called uh, museum and cradle function of tropical ecosystems that is the same that is going on today. So the fact that on tropical ecosystems, you have a rapid origination of new species, so high uh, origination rate. And at the same time, at the tropics, you have all the survivors, so lineages of organisms that are there and are staying there because that's a, the, the good place where to stay because maybe they got extinct when moving toward higher latitudes. So this is the way we define the... Sorry, this is a, a, an announcement here in the museum, it should be the last. Um, yeah, so this idea that tropics now and in the Permian, just before the mass extinction event, were in the past and are today, this, this huge, fantastic place for biodiversity when it's both uh, rapidly produced and also conserved there. Uh, it's, it's something that was put into crisis in this huge uh, Permian extinction event. So the role in, cons in producing and conserving biodiversity of tropical ecosystems in this specific event in the history of life where a mass extinction event was taking place was interrupted. At that time, we discovered that just moving a few uh, meters above in, in our section of rocks, so going uh, reading the history from before to after the mass extinction event, we, 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 we were able to demonstrate that this, this process was no more going on. So this idea that we have today, and this is a map for today, that we have this so-called latitudinal diversity gradient. So many species in the intertropical belt, and then less and less species as you move toward the poles. This was the situation more or less the same before the extinction, but after the extinction, this pattern was completely canceled, was completely um, destroyed. And tropical in that very moment, just after the event, so during and after the mass extinction event, the tropics did not, did not more 
no, no more function as cradles of biodiversity, but remain just museums. So just a number of species that were able to survive in that places remain there, but uh, the, the machine, no, the, 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 the constant uh, booster that we have uh, in the tropics for biodiversity that then spreads all over the world that is relevant for all over the world was, was switched off by this huge mass extinction event. I will come to that in, in a second. Uh, let, me, let me skip a number of, of, of slides. Uh, I will come to that in a second, but it's relevant for what we are going to say in, in a second. During this mass extinction event, uh, equilibria in, on which life, uh, as we know, as we understand it uh, before the events, is completely uh, put into crisis. And even these huge uh, great patterns of biodiversity that we recognize before the events are completely uh, knocked down during the events. So it's not just that biodiversity is put on crisis, but it's the whole, uh, let's say, global baron, balance of ecosystemic relationships, of evolutionary dynamics that is put into crisis during mass extinction events. In a way, you can consider mass extinction events as the point in which the threshold, as it's shown in the slide here, the threshold in which an, a, a global ecosystem balance go, goes after, goes over the threshold and goes in another equilibrium uh, uh, phase. But obviously before the event, you don't know where you would end up after the event. There is an eye we say high contingency during these events. So it's not possible to precisely uh, forecast what will happen during and after these events because these events are, com are, are extremely complex. The number of variables, the number of factors that are interlinked and that collapse during these events is so complex that it's pr practically impossible to model them and then to, and to forecast what is happening because of contingency, because it's not just about the way in which I understand species, is because species are um, in, in a time in which they are extremely um, vulnerable because they are very stressed, environmental stress, um, ecosystemic stresses that are summed, that are uh, where, 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 that is, uh, where you, you add other stresses. And so you put the system into the, 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 the classical com complex uh, scenarios, sorry, that these are more or less here, the complex scenarios that physicists describe uh, as the, the nucleus, the times, uh, the phases in which non-linear reaction are, uh, are happening. So you basically cannot uh, predict uh, what, what would happen. And this is, this is a good description of, uh, of the times between mass extinction and then the mass extinctions at the time in which you reach this, this threshold, and then after the mass extinction, you jump in another, uh, let's say, equilibrium phase in which the global ecosystems just balance moves to the right and to the left, but without going to these um, critical points toward uh, the, the threshold. Uh, but, but, after but after the extinctions, life continues. Actually, during and after the extinction, the um, diversification rates generally increases and the new ecosystemic relationships are built just after the events. In fact, even if 252 million years ago, life was near the complete end because 90, 95% of the species then alive, alive at the time went extinct during, during, during this event, but we are here telling this story. This means that after this dramatic event, extremely dramatic event, anyway, life was so, resilient, was so strong, was so powerful to regain and uh, evolution started again to create new diversity of species, number of species, but also new disparities, so different forms, but also new bio, um, biogeographical patterns, so new distributions of uh, groups uh, on the planet. And this is clear, or at least is described in this graph, when you see, where you see is not, you, you don't need to go into the details, but you just look at the pattern of the two, two lines. So the red line is the extinction rate. So when you see peaks that are moving toward the, the high, the, the, toward the top, so high peaks, uh, you see the, the, the moments in which in which extinction is going up and up. So the rate of extinction is accelerating, is going up. But as you notice, 
just after to the right, because time is moving from left to right, just after the red peak, there is always a blue peak. And the blue peak is the origination peak. That means that after the uh, moments in which life is going into crisis, there is a moment in which life is diversifying again. The new process, so it's not new processes actually, but the process of diversification of life is gaining ground again, and uh, it's, uh, it's uh, producing new life. And this is a continuous machine. So evolution has these two phases, uh, the origination and the extinction that they are the two, the two, yeah, the two phases, the two side of the coin of extinction, of evolution. Evolution is made by these two processes, not just one. Uh, the uh, extinction is, 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 uh, is fundamental for, for life to go on, uh, the so-called background extinction. So the one that, uh, cre create a continue a continuous uh, um, creation and extinction of species that make everything dynamic that makes history of life dynamic but also during these mass extinction events so when extinction rates peaks uh, anyway you have phases in which then diversity of life keep keep uh, uh, going keep uh, be becomes more and more important after this this event and this is important because th this means that we always have to look at extinction events as um, looking at the both sides. So from one side, what is happening to ecosystems and to species in put, uh, when they are put into crisis by these extinctions. And on the other side, what is happening in, with life that is resetting during and after these, these extinctions. Extinctions are not the end of life. For example, a couple of examples in studies that we did in the last uh, in the last years, or our colleagues did in the last years, uh, a number of species and groups, entire groups, obviously diversified just after the mass extinction events. This this is a proof that mass extinction do not just put into crisis life, but creates new opportunities for life. For example, the whole group that we called squamata that comprises lizards and snakes, they. Uh, diversified rapidly after one of these major extinction events, uh, the Permian-Triassic extinction event, uh, the one in uh, at two, 252 million years ago, as we uh, that, that I mentioned uh, earlier. But we can move to an, uh, to other mass extinction events. For example, in the last year years, we described uh, the um, first diversification of dinosaurs uh, that occurred just after one of these mass extinction events. The um, balance, let's say, of uh, the global planet, uh, planet uh, global ecosystem was reshuffled in a way and new opportunities were created. And um, dinosaurs were lucky enough to be there at the right time and they took their chance just after one of these mass extinction events. Uh, the same thing can be uh, said, and maybe this is the the the, the, the most uh, uh, important, uh, so the most popular of the effects of a mass extinction event. Uh, that is the transition, let's say, between the so-called reptilian world and the so-called mammalian world. Uh, that is not actually the, 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 is not a good description because mammals were um, present before the event and reptiles are present even after the event. But this is the, 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 let's say, the popular description of the so-called dinosaur extinction event that occurred about 66 million years ago. And this is a good example, anyway, of what happens when an entire uh, ecosystem, those dominated on lands by dinosaurs, large, large reptiles, was completely killed off or nearly completely killed off by a an, an, an mass extinction event, and another group uh, took his chance just after these mass extinction events. These were the mammals, and we are very lucky that we were part of this diversification after one of the most important mass extinction events in the history of life. So mass extinction has to be, to be understood in these both ways, as killer, but also as generator of new life. And actually, just a few months ago, a fantastic paper came out um, documenting and, and proving that uh, modern tropical forests, uh, those in which most of you uh, live or that you experience in, in, in Africa, as in, in Southern America, as in Asia, actually had their chance uh, just after the dinosaur extinction event. So the, the structure of uh, present day uh, tropical uh, forests 
So the complex and closed canopy, uh, the layers, different layers in which a forest, tropical forest is organized, uh, that, is, that is very unique of tropical forests, actually was not on the planet before the uh, Cretaceous Paleogene, so the dinosaur, let's say, extinction event 66 million ago, years ago, but um, its onset was right after, right at the, uh, this, this mass extinction event. Again, a new opportunity for life. Uh, dinosaurs probably have something to do with that. We know that they were good clearers of forests, you know, these large, very large um, herbivorous dinosaurs probably were very good at, uh, at clearing, at opening uh, forests because they were so large that they needed uh, an immense quantity of, um, of uh, vegetation. And so probably they experienced, they, they, they had a role in, in this change, so their disappearance as a, 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 a role in this. But not only that, also the, the, um, the ashes that fell on, 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 the, on the planet after the impact of the, the meteorite and many other hypotheses have been put, put forward. But what concerns us tonight is that this mass extinction event was a great opportunity for tropical forests, for example. So not only for mammals, not only for uh, squamates, so lizards and snakes, but also for tropical forests. So we have, in a way, um, in a way, we are we are um, we are the 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 the, the, the descendant descendants of that uh, of that mass extinction event. We are what we are because of that mass extinction event. So I guess it's important to look. This is another example on snakes. I could go on forever with the example of of. Um, of groups, entire groups or entire ecosystems that uh, um, we know today and that, uh, um, how to say, where uh, uh, their onset was at this mass extinction event. And this, I guess, is very important because we tend to look at extinctions only looking at that at the extinctions from one side. So the side of biodiversity is lost during this event. Actually, this is not true. Uh, uh, ecosystemic relationships are put into crisis uh, and crisis, the etymology of crisis, it's a Greek word that actually means this crisis, it's a phase in which things are changing and you uh, are put in, in a situation in which you have to make choices. This is the uh, etymology of the word crisis and extinctions are these, are crises. Actually, the father of the understanding of, of extinctions, that was Georges Cuvier, one of the greatest natural scientists of all times, uh, active in, uh, in the early 19th century and late uh, 18th century in Paris, uh, actually described mass extinctions as revolution, revolutions of life. That is actually a better way in which we uh, can describe uh, extinctions, because this is what really is. These are revolutions, deep perturbations. What this has to do, with the talks of today and the Anthropocene, well, this has much to do with, in my, in my point of view, because what we are experiencing now, it's a very dramatic, rapid change of uh, uh, ecos ecosystemic change. It's a great rapid perturbation, in incredibly rapid perturbation, uh, in which the rate of extinction is going up. Actually, the rightmost point in the graph that I already show you, this that is um, that is linked to a dashed line and not a continuous line because we are not yet there, but is the so-called sixth mass extinction. So is the extinction in which we are walking to. So we are going to. And this means that all that we study from the past, if today as mm, uh, a, a, a data from both extant and extinct species put together are describing, if we are in a phase in which we can say that we are approaching a sixth mass extinction, all that I said uh, tonight has to do with our world, has to do with what we are experiencing and what life will be in the next, uh, in the next decades, hundreds of years, millions of years. Because paleontology is great for this, because life has already gone through ecosystemic crisis ecosystemic deep perturbations. And so it's like to have a huge library in which you can read the story before, during, and after the event. And we can do that the same looking at fossils. So we can try, try to look at what's happening in life that was going into a mass extinction, into a crisis, 
how it survived the mass extinction and which species did not and why, and how life recovered, how rediversified, as I showed you before, after the events. And this is incredibly important, at least to my perspective, because with this zoom in and zoom out uh, um, exercise or perspective that I uh, introduced to you a few minutes ago, we can do, look at what is happening now, today, on a single tropical forest, uh, in a single uh, uh, garden here uh, uh, out of my door, and then we can step back and 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 resonate and and put forward hypothesis on how the single events would have an impact on the whole history of life, and and this this idea of a dramatic perturbation that is going on today, uh, both from this um, uh, biological, environmental, but also we will see on the social, economic, and uh, psychological aspects is what today it's under the umbrella of the idea of Anthropocene that was put forward by this uh, um, renowned professor, Paul Crutzen, uh, another Nobel laureate uh, the, for the so-called uh, ozone uh, um, layer uh, hole. Uh, he was a, a chemist uh, of the, of the atmosphere, atmosphere chemists, and uh, he was so, uh, so clever to put forward the idea that, uh, uh, I will go, well, I will go in, in, into that in a second, the idea that uh, the, the global ecosystems, and in particular, he was keen on looking at uh, um, of the composition of the atmosphere and temperature of the atmosphere is changing today so rapidly that this is this 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 rapid phase and the magnitude of the changes that we are experiencing are so huge that are more are better understood in a geological perspective instead of a historical perspective because no other man or woman in the history of life has ever in the history of humanity has ever seen the transition that we are seeing in these years but life has seen has seen already transitions like this so the idea of um, calling our present days Anthropocene, uh, Anthropocene is the idea that the scene, so the last part of the world, uh, has to do with geological magnitudes, geological transformations. And this, this, this term, I will go to, into that in a second, is gaining more and more popularity. As you see from this graph, it was introduced in 2000, but for the, for the first 10 or 15 years, actually, no, not, it was not used so much, at least in publications, uh, popular and scientific publication. But in the last five, seven years, more or less, um, its use started to become more and more common. So what, what is the meaning of the Anthropocene? What, what, what was uh, Paul Crutzen um, thinking when he put forward the, the idea of Anthropocene? And what this has to do with what we said before? So with the idea that there is an ecosystemic crisis going on, there is a, a sixth mass extinction going on or uh, just out of, of the, the door. I will go that into that for the next few minutes and then uh, going to, toward the end of this, of this talk. So the idea of Anthropocene is that we have a calendar of life, of uh, time, of Earth time, that is this one that geologists do to name the different time beans in the history of life. So maybe you have already heard uh, words, uh, nouns like uh, Permian, Triassic, Jurassic, that is obviously famous, Mesozoic, and so on. Uh, we are living today, uh, looking at this calendar, in the Holocene that I've highlighted in this, uh, in this part. It's, so it is the uppermost part of this huge calendar of the history of life. And if you look at this calendar, we are looking into an epoch. We are living in an epoch that is called Holocene. This Holocene epoch started about 11,000 years ago, and this moment between 10 and 11 years ago is the time when, as you see from these graphs, this graph that plots the temperature, average temperature on the globe uh, through time, left again is deep in the past, uh, 40,000 years ago, the scale now is tons, thousands of years and not million, millions of years. Uh, so to the right, uh, to the left, thousands of years, 40,000, 30,000, 20,000, uh, 20, and then to the right, it's zero, so today. As you see, you see all these fluctuations of temperature in the last 10,000 of years, and then you reach at about 10, 11,000 years ago, you reach this kind of plateau, 
this kind of flat uh, phase that characterized the last 10,000 years, more or less. This is what we call the Holocene optimum, climatic optimum. That means temperatures remain more or less flat, stable during the last 10,000 years. And this has been our lucky moment. This is the time in which humanity has diversified. Uh, we, so we, we took our chance because the climate was the right one for our species that is so and so good at uh, um, coping with uh, these huge fluctuations and is much better uh, coping with these um, more or less stable um, temperatures. And so this last, let's say, equilibrium phase, last 10,000 years, is what now is called Holocene. Holocene is the, this, let's say, uh, equilibrium phase in the last 10,000 years. But as uh, Paul Kruzen and, and as all we know, uh, in the very last years, in the last hundred of years, uh, possibly even less, let's say from the Industrial Revolution, this uh, curve, this curve of temperatures is, tight, is starting to rising again. To, so to going into a different uh, equilibrium, possibly at a certain time, but now we are in a phase of rapid change of uh, temperature. And therefore, Paul Kruzen was saying, so if we are going, if this line is no more in this table, let's say, um, phase, but it's going up, so it is changing. It doesn't matter really, actually, if it is going up or down. But the idea is, if the stability is broken and we are going into a different uh, scenario, so uh, we should use another word to call the word that we are living now. So it's no more the Holocene, but it's the Anthropocene, he said. So it's another geological period because, it, uh, because the balance, the equilibrium, the, the, uh, yeah, the interactions in this uh, uh, world is different, uh, this, let's say, from the former one. So no more in this stable Holocene, but in a more um, changing up and down, possibly brutally um, variating temperature in, a, in another um, geological epoch that we should call uh, Anthropocene. So this is the basic idea. And then geologists from this uh, very first uh, hint started to look at evidences. If we have evidences to say uh, in the rocks, in the sediments, uh, that not only the temperature in the air, but the whole ecosystem in, on the planet is changing. And actually geologists are finding these evidences. Uh, so there are evidences that say that a geologist in the future, one million years from now, looking back at our times, will be able, looking at rocks, looking at sediments, to say, oh yes, that was no more the Holocene, but something else began. It was the Anthropocene. Because many things are changing now, and uh, the, sed the sediments record, record everything, or not really everything, but many of the processes that are going on today. So the biophysical system of the world, it's, it's in a way recorded every day in the sediments that you that, that are accumulating in caves, in the bottom of the oceans, in the bottom of the lakes, into ring trees, and so on. So there, there are a number of possible proxies, but they are there, and they are recording these huge shifts. So geologists are saying, yes, Paul Crutzen was right. Something is changing very rapidly, and therefore it's a, a good idea to name this new phase Anthropocene, this new epoch, geological epoch, Anthropocene. Um, there are a number of uh, detailed issues on this, and I will skip on that, just to let you know that there is a group, a formal group of geologists that is uh, formalizing this word, and probably this term, Anthropocene, and probably in mid-2022, uh, there will be the final decision, so a vote uh, into this commission to use or not, uh, to put or not into this huge calendar of life, the word Anthropocene. And uh, all, all, uh, all, all the news that I have uh, are saying that, yes, they will probably uh, formalize the term Anthropocene. And from that day, we will say that we, we live in Anthropocene. But when is that day? So that, that will be the day in which they will decide if we live in the Anthropocene or not. But when will the Anthropocene start on that calendar? 10,000 years ago, started the Holocene. When do the Anthropocene started? Geologists are fighting to try to find the, the best evidences in the sediments to say, yes, from that moment, Anthropocene began. Uh, that is something that has 
mostly to do with markers. So the markers that you select to be found in the rocks and connected with the, the onset of the Anthropocene. So you can look for plastics, for example, the first time that you see plastic remains into the sediments, into the rocks. You can look at the composition of, for example, the atmosphere as it is recorded into the rocks. But, and the number, I won't list them here, but the number of different markers and number of different proxies, therefore, have been proposed to mark the beginning of the Anthropocene. And if you use different markers, you end up with different starting points of the Anthropocene. And therefore, there are, uh, there are hypotheses uh, for which Anthropocene starts uh, 10,000 years ago, 6 million years, uh, 6,000 years ago, 200 years, in, uh, 200 years ago, or in mid 20th century. That is the most accepted now hypothesis. So the, the, the best, the, the, the most uh, probable scenario is that in mid 2022, um, the Anthropocene Working Group in the International Commission on Stratigraphy will vote that the Anthropocene actually began in mid, as it is written in this paper, in mid 20th century. And this is only for practical reasons, because mid 20th century, there is the radioactive atomic fallout of the bombs that were uh, used in, uh, in, 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 in the Second World War, but also all the tests that have been done during the Cold War uh, phase in the Pacific. And these put into the air a number of uh, new um, elements, uh, new radio radioactive elements that then precipitated all over the world and accumulated as a perfect layer of new elements all over the world, in the seas, in the lakes, even in the caves. And so this is practical for geologists. So the, the, what we will probably uh, be decided is this. The Anthropocene will be used from uh, sediments and from events that occurred from mid 20th century onward. But this is a detail for us. The fact is that um, everything started from recognizing that uh, the whole ecosystem is changing and part of this global ecosystem change is also recorded in this layer. And so from a technical point of view, geologists will be happy with this, but we are not, uh, meaning that uh, this is not the processes that we are mostly interested with, but we are mostly interested in the Anthropocene as a dramatic perturbation in ecosystems, because this can be understood from looking at today as evidences, but also at the past. And this is the last part of the talk in which uh, yeah, I will highlight this, 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 uh, this understanding of the Anthropocene, that formally it will be an epoch defined, defined as I said, but the most important interesting thing for us, I guess also for uh, everyone that is interested in conservation, is not that we will have a new world for calling the present, but is that there is a focus on the Anthropocene as event as an event in which the balance, the whole global balance, let's say, the whole global equilibrium is rapidly changing. Because, because this, why? Because this makes it comparable with other events in, in the past. And because it is very comparable with other events in the past as mass extinction events that, as we said, are incredibly complex. Let me go, let me go here. They are incredibly complex events that therefore should be understood with that mindset, with the mindset of the complexity of events in which you can understand um, uh, the dynamics only looking at all the interactions, the feedbacks, the emergent properties, the uh, nonlinear reactions that are very, that are so uh, typical of stressed phases, of stressed environments. This is the, the important thing of understanding the Anthropocene as a change, let's say, from an epoch to another. Not because it's a new epoch, but because we are, trans, trans, uh, we are going from one epoch to another. And the, the, this, this means that there is something huge going on, some new, um, yeah, new equilibrium that is going to be, um, uh, that, that, that we are going through, that we are, this, this, this huge perturbation that we are going through. So looking more generally at the, the word Anthropocene and moving from these physical, biological evidences to the more um, 
integrated approach of Anthropocene that is the only one that to me has a meaning because during the um, perturbation, during the uh, great transformation, during the extinction of the dinosaurs, no conscious um, uh, species was at, there at the time. So no one understood what, what was going on. Today we have, we have this great opportunity of being a, a species that can understand what is going on and therefore the Anthropocene is more and more gaining this rich uh, um, um, meaning, not only of this physical, biological, um, environmental transition, but also of a, a, a sociological and cultural transformation. That is exactly the way in which we understand the word ecosystemic, because being an organism, part of the earth ecosystem, Obviously, if we, if, we, if we talk about ecosystemic changes, we also include so, so, uh, social systems and cultural systems. Therefore, it makes very much sense to understand the uh, Anthropocene in this way. So a phase of transition of be, be, deep perturbation of all complex systems from, let's say, the biological uh, one in our forest without uh, humanity to those that are inside our societies that obviously interlink one with the other to produce the Anthropocene. And so I would say that these, looking, going from etymology, mer, the, mer, the simple etymology of the word to semantics, I would say that these are the most, uh, 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 let's say, relevant ways in which we can understand the Anthropocene. So a formally dispute time being, but a powerful unifying concept. So geologists will fight to understand and to decide when the Anthropocene begin, what is the Anthropocene epoch and so on. But this concept uh, of, of um, uh, geological scale, tran scale transition is the one that we, uh, um, that we like of this word Anthropocene, that is good as a platform of discussion for the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene, as Deepesh Chakrabarti said a few years ago, the Anthropocene is the point of convergence between the history of the planet and the, hist and the human history. Yes, it's the first time that we have a transition of this magnitude in which you, a, 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 a species like us, let's say, is present. It's a platform for discussion on the relationship between the humanity and nature, starting from the same supposed dichotomy, as we were saying. Transition there, transition here, the transitions are connected, obviously. Also, because in this case, we know that we are the meteorite <laughs> that, is, uh, that has started this uh, collapse of event, this, series, this cascade of event that brought us into a mass extinction scenario. It's a cognitive revolution with respect to the place of humanity, yes, stemming from the former point. And it's a phase of rapid reconsideration of social values. And I will go into this last part of the talk, going into this idea of social values, because Anthropocene has this specific, uh, um, let's say, uh, um, uh, meaning that is not just that of, by, uh, of physical uh, descriptions that we can get looking at sediments, but is all, also this um, uh, entire different ways in which any one of us sees at these transitions and this transition, understand these transitions, live, feel this transition. And so to me, Anthropocene is not just the markers that you see in the, in the rocks, but it's also the markers that we are, let's say, defining by describing how, how we feel this transition. You know, it's like if uh, dinosaurs were there describing the extinction that they were living. They did not left their thought, the thoughts, they just left their bones. But during the Anthropocene, we can discuss and we can, uh, how to say, uh, build as evidence for the transition that is going on, also the cultural, the social transition that is going on, that we feel in a way. And therefore, the Anthropocene is also this, this number of different feelings with respect of this transition. So therefore, Anthropocene is defined also by the uh, confident approaches to the Anthropocene that we read in the transcendal, tran transcendal in the fideistic uh, uh, way in which some people look at this transition. In the hopeful way in which some other look at this transition, there will be a better world uh, after this uh, um, after the shaking uh, uh, phase. Some other people think this. Some other people are angry and they say, 
no, we should, we should go back or we should go forward in a completely different way. This is another way in which the Anthropocene can be defined. And this cultural way in which we define the Anthropocene is as important as the physical evidences of the Anthropocene in defining what is Anthropocene. If we don't want the Anthropocene to be just a word that says that from 1946, we are in a new epoch. That is very sterile, it's very, it's very uh, unus un unuseful, at least to my mind. So all this the Anthropocene, the transition in physical system and the transition in the way in which we read and we feel and we live in the Anthropocene. And this is very clear if we look at the whole, the whole um, deep perturbations that we have also in the way in which we react to this uh, Anthropocene. And so the social civil movements in the, play, in, the, in, the, in the streets, in the squares that are now let's say the, the, the cultural uh, evidence of this rapid transition, of this imbalanced uh, moment in which we are living. And, uh, and, and this goes down into our streets, go down into our rooms and goes down into our museums. And so it's no, not only the idea that uh, uh, what is uh, uh, in living today is uh, uh, changing, but also the way in which we are understanding the uh, objects that we have in our museums that testify the Anthropocene, that testify the changes of the Anthropocene that are under recon reconsideration, that are leaving this phase of rapid reconsideration of values, as we said a few slides ago. And the last, uh, these last slides, I'm going to conclude in a few minutes, uh, are devoted to this. So the idea that we are not only in the Anthropocene considering what is going on in our forests, in our and open landscapes in our wildlife, but we are also forced to reconsider everything that has to do with Anthropocene, it has to do with the way in which we understand the world we are. And this has to do also with the objects that we decided that, that we keep as a heritage of our presence on the world in our museums. And part of this reason, and part of this, of this, of this, this, uh, let's say, uh, of this mindset uh, of this reconsideration as to do, uh, uh, it dives into the problems or into new uh, way in which we should understand our biodiversity collections. Because collections are uh, natural history collections that are in our museums are the, uh, let's say, the, 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 the way in which we decided we want to keep preserve for future generations to study, to study today and to study for the futures, to see them uh, parts of our world. Some are still alive, some are still there, but some are, are preserved only in the museums. And we gave the museum this incredibly important role of keeping there the objects that, uh, that represent our world. As if an alien was coming from um, from outside our planet, and we said, do, do, we want to tell you a story. We want to tell you how life formed, how life diversified, and how men interacted with life. We take you to the museum, because there is the place where we decided collectively as humanity to, uh, to preserve, to put in a safe place these um, evidences, these, these um, uh, precious uh, um, documentation of life and relationship between the different organisms, men comprised. It's a huge um, task, the one, the, the, those that have been um, given, given to museums. Museums are incredibly important in this. Uh, there are species that, are, as you know, that are no more uh, alive, but are in the museums. There are entire ecosystems that are no more uh, uh, visible on the planet and are documented in the museums. And there are very, um, uh, let's say, uh, precious species, uh, very uh, endangered species, for example, very close to extinction that are uh, better documented in museums than on in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the wildlife. Uh, and so museums has this incredibly important role, but the, uh, let's say, uh, not so, how to say, the, the, the way in which 
the, this, this huge heritage has been accumulated into the museums, we know, it's very often uh, a story of, uh, um, uh, how is it called, of, um, um, of, uh, um, of, 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 of stolen uh, uh, specimens. I, it doesn't come to my mind the, the right word, but a stolen specimen of, of uh, um, a huge uh, amount of material that flow into the museums in the colonial period. Or even today, even with all the permits that you can get to uh, study uh, biodiversity, for example, in the tropical area, it's uh, still uh, customary to take the specimen and bring them to the museums, for example, in the rich Euro Europa, in, in the Europe, in the rich North uh, America, in the rich uh, uh, Australia. And so our collections in Europe, in North America, but in many other places, even in China, in Japan, are full of specimens that describe Anthropocene, that describe the changes of the Anthropocene in places that are very far from uh, uh, the places where the specimens are preserved. This, as uh, in the last years, this is uh, a topic of huge debate into the museums. And I guess, and I, I, I see this moment of rapid transition also of social values, of cultural dynamics, of uh, uh, feelings uh, that we are experiencing today as the good time in which we should put under discussion what we should do with all these, these collections. Uh, for example, in the museum where I work, uh, Muse Science Museum in Trento, we have a huge collection of uh, amphibians from uh, the tropical belt, in particular for, from Tanzania. Because, because Why? Because Michele Menegon was working uh, there and was bringing specimens here. And so my last uh, sentence or last sentences of this talk is, what should we do with all these collections? Some museums are saying we are keeping uh, very safe and perfect these collections and we will make, we make ava available um, the data all over the world. So the data that are connected, that are stemming from those specimens. And obviously specimens are available to anyone, just come to our museums. There is another way in which we can tackle this, this uh, huge issue that has to do with, uh, with the way in which we are humanity, in which we collaborate all together, in which we stop uh, this uh, uh, um, uh, nonsense of uh, uh, bringing things all around the world without thinking what we are doing. And the other way in which we are, we are thinking, uh, we, can, we can tackle this, this topic is, uh, let's bring the specimen back. Let's try to have new places in which we can store this, uh, this huge heritage that we, um, that we give to museums to be preserved for the, uh, the future and for, and for humanity and put, and put the, the specimens back. And that it's another way in which we can tackle this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this huge problem that we have today, facing today in our museums. If one wants to study, uh, the biodiversity of, I don't know, insects uh, of a certain area of uh, Africa that has been explored by Italian um, researchers, German, American, and so on, probably a student has to come to Italy or Germany or to France to study those specimens. Is this okay? It might be okay, but we have to find a way, for example, to uh, then uh, to have the possibility to take these specimens and bring them safely uh, for a loan into the place where the, stu the student wants to study the, the specimens. Or we have to take the whole collection and completely change its place from Italy and bring the collection back to the place, to the nearest museum, to the place where these things have been collected. Or again, we can try to find ways in which we can rapidly exchange material. Or again, we can try to work with digital data. There are a number of different uh, ways in which we can tackle this problem, but the problem is here and has to do with the Anthropocene transition, has to do with the transition in which the world before and the world today and after is no more the same. And I guess this can be, uh, how to say, uh, finally, not, 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 uh, not resolved, but the, our, our role as, as humans can be accomplished only if uh, 
we decide together what to do with those things. We decide together that there's no more, uh, as they are doing in these days in Glasgow, trying to decide that maybe it's not a good idea to continue uh, increased uh, temperature in, uh, in, the, in the atmosphere, as they do in, uh, in other uh, meetings, deciding what to do with biodiversity in uh, all around the world. I, I think we should also discuss this. What, what we should do with uh, all the heritage that we have in our museums. Up to today, this discussion that is lively, but it's still inside the museums. So we are asking ourselves what we should do with our specimen. I guess that the whole, the more, more general, the, the every, everyone that has to do with conservation, that has to do with heritage, that has to do with their own future. I am a student in, I don't know, in Congo, and I want to study my specimen. I want to study my specimens here, or I want to study my specimen in another place. We should solve this thing together and try to find a way in which this huge transition that we are living brings us to a better place in which uh, we want to live because, and this is really the last quotation of of uh, quote of my sorry, the last quote of my talk, as Robert McFarlane wrote in a recent book from from himself. We find speaking of the Anthropocene, even speaking in the Anthropocene, difficult. It is perhaps best imagined as an epoch of loss of species, of places, of people. I can say of contact with our specimens in our collections, for which. We are seeking a language, a language of grief. And, and this is the part that we should develop from now on, even harder to find a language of hope. We should find a way in which this huge transition brings us to a new world, because a new world will be there, uh, in which these problems, uh, let's say, are solved in the best way we can as the cleverest, cleverest, uh, species that have ever lived in four billion years. Thank you. Hope this is in some way helpful for your discussion and not too far from your conservation uh, uh, point of view that is so important in our world today. Thank you. Massimo, I would like to invite everybody to um, take part, ask your questions, feel free. Um, at the bottom of the screen, you have the reaction tools, please use it. Otherwise, wave your hand um, and we will get to you. You can also ask your questions in the chat and um, we will att attend to everybody as soon as possible. Um, I'm now going to give over to Alistair. Thanks, Alistair. Thanks very much, Johan. Um, so yeah, guys, if you can just put your, your hands up and uh, let us know if you'd like to ask any questions. Um, there is a straight out, the, out the, the, the stable door here is Andrew. He's got a question for you, uh, Massimo. So um, I'm asking you to unmute Andrew. Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, to Massimo. Uh, thank you very much for this profound, interesting uh, talk. It's, it's, it's very um, extremely um, interesting. Now, um, coming back to, to the world as currently as it is, there is so much on everybody's mouth about global warming resulting in climate change. And um, now the question is, are we seeing a repeat of a natural extinction or if you like the history of us, extinction of history of life um, as during the Cretaceous era? Yeah, unfortunately, um, some 10 years ago, I guess, uh, uh, Anthony Barnowski, that is a great paleontologist from, um, from um, University of California, uh, had, had this idea of comparing the rate of extinction uh, that we are experiencing today with that of past mass extinctions. And uh, uh, he did so by taking the uh, evaluation of uh, uh, the conservation state status uh, by uh, IUCN and uh, projecting uh, the uh, 
uh, probability of extinction of uh, uh, the living species today uh, to the end of the century. And so he took this, uh, uh, this, this scale and compare it to the uh, rate of extinction uh, in, uh, during the uh, mass extinctions in the past. And what we are seeing is, 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 is really, uh, yeah, it's something that you can believe. So the rate of extinction that we are experiencing today is faster than the rate of extinction that life has experienced during the Cretaceous, Paleogene mass extinction, that is the so-called dinosaur mass extinction. That is incredibly, incredible if you think, because at that time, a meteorite 15 kilometers in diameter hit our planet, creating a, 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 devastating rap, a devastatingly rapid effect. Obviously, some species were killed just at that time, so seconds or minutes after the impact the huge majority were killed in the days, years, and, thousands, and hundreds and thousands of years after the event, because obviously ecosystems have their own um, uh, they, they resilient, resilience, so they can, they can buffer uh, the, the, the changes at, at, until a certain point. Uh, but anyway, you can think that the event was incredibly rapid. The rates that we are experiencing today, they are they seem to be even faster than the one that have been recorded by, by that event. And this, this, this to me, it's one of the, the, the clearest uh, evidences of the impossibility of life to take the pace of the extinction of th that we are uh, producing. We are stronger, we are. Uh, uh, harder, beating harder than a meteorite. Literally, we are beating harder than a meteorite. And so this, this is this is data. This is this is just there. You just need to count species uh, in the past, uh, in the present. And out. Uh, there are, however, a number of things that went wrong uh, in the Cretaceous Paleogene mass extinction that are not yet that wrong. That are not yet that bad today. Uh, for example, we know that all mass extinctions uh, had to do also with huge uh, phases of uh, um, ocean, acidi ocean acidification, of methane release from the bottom of the oceans, uh, for, uh, with uh, uh, events of uh, um, mass devastation of lands, and we know that if uh, the seas collapse, obviously the primary producers that sustain the whole world, the whole global ecosystem collapse. But also if there is a too um, increased uh, hyd uh, hyd hydrological cycle on lands, uh, this brings uh, too much sediment into the oceans, killing the oceans. So if rivers are too, power, too powerful because it rains too much, uh, uh, this kills also the oceans. So there is this interlink between what is happening in the oceans and on land, also from a, mer a merely uh, physical, uh, um, physical dynamic. And all these dynamics reach at a certain point, a critical point, after which you can no more gain equilibrium. And we know that we are not there yet. So the rate of release of methane from the uh, seabed, the rate of devastation of lands that flow into the oceans, the rate of uh, um, degradation of uh, uh, the primary productivity in the oceans is at a serious risk now, it's increasing, but is not yet at the point that is comparable with the extinctions in the past. So we know we are not yet there at the critical point. We are going toward the, rich, the, critical pain, uh, the critical point. In fact, we are going, uh, we are living in more stressed and stressed environment. And therefore the critical point, the critical threshold is approaching faster and faster. We are, but we are not there yet, or at least by comparing these phenomena in the past and in the present, we seem to be some order uh, lower, order of magnitude lower than what was happening in the past. So biodiversity is decreasing at a rate that is comparable with the extinctions in the past. Other physical parameters are not yet at that rate of degradation, of, tra of transition. And that's a hope. 
and that's a hope because that means that there is still something to do uh, before the, the uh, before just stating that we are in a mass extinction and we don't uh, we can do anything uh, and just wait because uh, contingency will will uh, say what will happen to our future thank you very much massimo thank you to you andrew thanks thanks andrew thanks massimo catherine chair up um, has a question for you massimo I'm asking you to unmute Catherine. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Massimo, for the very interesting uh, presentation. I have two questions. Um, from a paleontologist perspective, how, how, do, how do you measure the diversity of species? And the second question is, um, you said we are, we, we are headed to a mass extinction. And I'm just wondering, uh, is it, is it because we are not using uh, ecosystem services in a good way? And if, it, if, that, if that's the case, uh, do you, how do we come into uh, a balance with economic development and also you know, sustain our ecology? Thank you very much, Catherine. Very tough questions. The, 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 the last in particular, um, I, might, I might win the Nobel Prize if I have uh, the good answer <laughs> to the second part of your, of your question. So I won't, I won't probably be able, but let's start with the first that is much easier for me. So paleontologists uh, um, uh, describe a species and then uh, study and so calculate the extinction rate by looking at uh, the um, uh, what, what we call the, the first appearance and the last appearance of species uh, in uh, uh, in our uh, in our paleontological in our geological record. So therefore, we calculate we, we measure when let's say each species appeared and when each species disappeared, and when we plot let's say these together, we can um, we can measure the uh, average rate. Uh, in, we, on we, in which species originate, with which species originate, and the average rate in which, on which species disappear. And uh, we can then calculate the rate of, uh, of uh, origination and extinction. And uh, um, the whole, let's say, calculation that we uh, end up with, it's uh, the, um, the rate in which evolution works, let's say, no? in which evolution is powered by the appearance and the disappearance of species. We generally, therefore, work with species. Number of species is biodiversity. But, but as I said in my first slides, the uh, rock record, the paleontological record, is highly incomplete, incomplete. And therefore, most of the times, we do not rely on uh, species because we are never sure, we are never yeah, sure that we are really looking at the first appearance and the last appearance datum for species. Because a species can appear anywhere in the world and the last one can live in any other part of the world. Therefore, it's very improbable that with the, the outcrops that we have available, that are very few, and with the knowledge that we have that is very limited, we are really able to catch the very first appearance and the very last appearance of a single species. Therefore, we generally do our calculations during higher taxonomical ranks. Therefore, not species, but generally genera or families. In doing so, we are less, uh, we have uh, uh, obviously uh, less, uh, uh, let's say, how to say, the, the, the granularity of our understanding of the world is, is obviously coarser. We are not that precise, but we are, we are, we are, our data are more um, um, reliable. We can rely on that because the first and the last um, representative organism that live in a family or in a genera is much more easier to catch probabilistically, is much more easier to catch in the geological record instead of a single species. Therefore, nowadays, uh, um, conservation biologists use uh, indexes to measure biodiversity, looking at genetic diversity, phylogenetic diversity, species diversity, and so on. Unfortunately, paleontologists cannot do that, and, uh, and but we rely on higher taxonomical ranks. And it's, there are many studies that demonstrate that it's better to do so instead of 
making huge possible huge mistakes uh, uh, because you don't you didn't get the right outcrop or the right fossil in the right uh, outcrop. There is a huge part of luck in our in our job, just getting the the first or the last fossil. So this is the maybe the easiest part of the question. The second part is uh, uh, something that yeah it's. It's the question, maybe, no? How, how today? So, how can put together uh, the diversity uh, of uh, of life, keeping uh, conserving biodiversity, and at the same time uh, living uh, in uh, this planet uh, in uh, seven, eight, uh, nine billions of uh, of humans? And this is something, unfortunately, that paleontology cannot tell us because uh, there has never been an, ex an, uh, an experiment like the one that we are doing today on, on the planet, or at least there have been a number, but they ended up very bad for uh, who was living before. So there have been times in the history of life in which a single type of organism became dominant and uh, its products uh, were put, it's, um, it's, uh, even its, uh, its um, residual products were put in the, in, the, in, the, in the atmosphere and in the oceans in such a, a, a volume that the whole ecosystem uh, was collapsed by that phase. I'm thinking, for example, at the uh, great diversification of, uh, of uh, cyanobacteria that happened about two billions and a half a million years ago. Uh, and it's a phase in which very rapidly uh, cyanobacteria, so the one that produce uh, oxygen as, a, as a, a result of their metabolism, um, they, they polluted the whole world with oxygen. And that was uh, uh, something that was uh, uh, polluting even for them. Uh, but uh, it was, uh, they were so many, they were so many on the planet that they changed the, the, the chemistry of the atmosphere forever. And actually, we are here because of that catastrophic event. But that catastrophic event killed off many uh, of the species living before, and even of cyanobacteria. Therefore, we, I guess, we don't have we don't have uh, uh, good uh, um, lessons to learn from past uh, extinctions. And therefore, the only thing we can do is to find our own uh, solution to tackle this uh, this trouble. I guess the paleontologist cannot help very much in saying how we should live with, uh, uh, in nature, in the biodiversity. Uh, but as uh, I tried to explain, there are a number of, let's say, uh, signals, red alarms, uh, that are uh, those that have been hitted every time life was going into crisis, uh, that are good lessons uh, to learn from the past. So things, balances, thresholds that should not be approached because in the in the in the past they brought to catastrophic collapses and so at least this can be taken taken into considerations for example uh, fragmented fragmenting too much populations of species it's something that happened in the past and we know that this brought ecosystems to collapse uh, we know that if you don't um, create the if you don't have, sorry, the opportunities to migrate or you don't have time enough to adapt, species uh, um, end up, species got extinct. And we can, how to say, even though not with the precision that we would like, we can fix or at least try to describe the parameters, the limits to this, uh, to this phenomena that should not be it. Uh, all, everything else, it's uh, our own uh, creativity, at least. We know uh, our species has been able to go out from very uh, dangerous times. For example, the last glaci glacial phase about uh, 15,000 years ago, we were able to cope with uh, a dramatic uh, drop in temperatures. Uh, and we did not have the technology that we have today. And anyway, Homo sapiens has been able to cope with, uh, with that uh, rapid uh, climatic phase. This one is much worse, but we, we have many more uh, uh, opportunities today, and uh, also the fact that we are talking to each other, you are in Africa and I'm in Europe, is something that our ancient uh, um, Homo sapiens uh, 5,000 years ago were not able to do. And so I guess this cooperation uh, is something that we should, uh, in a way, um, uh, yeah, uh, use 
to, to tackle the, the, the problems that we have. Probably single populations, no? single groups, single tribes, we are trying to cope with past changes. Today we are a single tribe. We have a lot of problems being all too connected, but we can get also a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of help in being together. Thank you, Massimo. Catherine, I'm asking you to unmute. Is your, have, your, have your questions been answered? Yes, my question has been answered. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, um, Judith. Um, I'm asking you to unmute. Judith has a question for you, Massimo. <laughs> Indeed. Um, hello. Um, that was a lovely talk, Massimo. I really enjoyed it. My question is, when we're looking at mass extinctions over time, we are using different kinds of data sets. The, the, the big five mass extinctions are based on fossils we have actually identified and fossils that suddenly disappeared from the fossil record, right? And, yeah. the, and the sixth mass extinction, we're basing on what's happening to the animals we know about and the animals we know, with the, uh, the animals that are going extinct in our lifetimes. And my, my question is, if it's true that only about three to 7% of animals that ever lived have been preserved in the fossil record, we're dealing with a, a very, very small number of species, and we're probably underestimating the severity of those previous mass extinctions. So my question is, is it fair to use such different kinds of, of assessments trying to understand what's happening to the world now? Great question. Thank you so much. Uh, I I was I, I I skipped that part because it's quite technical, let's say. So I will keep it very very simple now. Even in my last uh, in my last answer uh, to Catherine, uh, I made reference only at the basic principle. Uh, actually, uh, the, 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 the 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 short answer to your question is. Yes, it's very biased. Our knowledge of the past is very biased toward not only the um, three, five percent of the, the biodiversity that has been preserved, but also there is a study bias. So there are groups that are more studied than others. There are environments that are more studied than others. And there is also a huge difference between the knowledge that we have for today's ecosystems and the past ecosystems because most of the species that we know from the past are from marine sediments because uh, the, the, the fossils more, most commonly preserved in marine environments, in marine strata. Whereas the knowledge that we have today, we know, is mostly based on continental biodiversity because we don't know most of the biodiversity of the oceans because it's too hard to study because many, many people, most of the people study continental biodiversity and not uh, ocean biodiversity and so on. So there is this, these are main uh, bias and more there is the bias that you mentioned. But to be fair, or actually to be more precise, uh, the, the way in which we study uh, extinction rates in the past is not just uh, at looking at uh, um, the um, raw value, so the presence or the absence of a species at a certain time or in a certain layer, but actually now, this is the way it was uh, compiled in the past. So presence, absence means live or death. Now we don't do this no more. We have a number of uh, uh, models that help us to cope with this bias. So for example, we, um, when we do this calculation, we take into consideration how many outcrops, uh, how many formations uh, of rocks uh, have or do not have fossils, how probable it is to find a fossil 
or improbabilities to find it, grounding on the different environments that are represented in the rocks, the size of, uh, uh, of a specimen, we know that is easier to catch a larger than a smaller fossil, uh, the number of uh, the, the effort that has been put on studying different groups. So there are a number of corrections that we do in our models to have the picture the more reliable as possible. So what we, what we do in the past, it's getting uh, more and more comparable to what we know today. However, there is still a gap. There is still a huge gap that will never be um, uh, I would say solved. We will always have this, but if you, if you look at in the last 20, 30 years, how much we have improved our uh, yeah our correction, the correction that we put on our data, I think that they are yeah they are really getting much and more much more um, more and more reliable through time. So yeah, probably we won't uh, get a, a full fully comparable picture even for the very recent events, even for the quaternary extinctions that are just a few thousands of years from, uh, from now. But I think they are getting more and more comparable, especially for the events that are extremely well dated in the past, because this is another key element. If you want to read a story uh, from moment to moment uh, in, a, in an event that occurred millions of years ago, you have to have the correct, the, the most precise data dating for each of the layers that you are reading in the past, that you are excavating in, in your rocks. And this is available only for very few <coughs> intervals in the history of life. The Permatriassic mass extinction or the Cretaceous mass extinction, the two extinctions that I've mentioned through the talk, they have, have been studying so much. There are so many groups uh, of, of researchers in the world studying those events that we have a good pictures. So at least for some of the extinction in the past, in the past, I guess, we are getting closer and closer to having this data, paleontological data, really at work, really useful. And this is the only way to me in which paleontology can save itself. Because if not, we, 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 we remain stamp collectors. We remain fossil collectors. We remain those who clean the teeth of the dinosaur. That is not at all useful for our uh, life today, for the crisis that we are experiencing today. Yes, we have all the fascination, all the, 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 you know, the empathy that we have with these creatures of the past. But if we want reliable data, the only thing that we can do is yeah, doing all, all that we can to model, to correct uh, all these biases that we inevitably have in the past. Thank you. Thank you, Thank so you much. Massimo, for a fascinating answer. Judith, you covered, as we normally say. And thank you also for a very interesting question. Um, Jennifer, would you please translate your, uh, your chat <laughs> to, to us? I, I, you say thank you, and then you say, Massimo, appreso uh, moltissimo. Yeah. She, has been, she has been very kind in saying that, uh, uh, yeah, basically she, yeah, she liked what, what, what she heard tonight. So. Yeah, it was it was a very kind uh, message from her. And and I and I pointed and I, I specifically wanted to point that out because I am uh, I am in line with her comment. So thank you very much, <laughs> um, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I also see Paulo Menegas. Uh, somehow I have a feeling that Paulo Menegas should also raise his voice somewhere. Um, uh, we are sort of running to the two hour timeline what we're going to do is we're going to allow people to unmute themselves uh massimo this talk needs a follow -up. there's just no doubt in my mind that it needs a follow-up i think you know um there are so many people who would i think like to ask questions and get clarity about things so we will also organize that so that we can have a if it's okay with you have a follow-up and uh, you can share with us um, because I think it's just such a fascinating topic. A lot of our people who come in are people who are generally interested in the bigger world, not necessarily specialists, but somebody like you open up so many 
of the worms that we are we not aware of or things that troubles us and it just makes it so logic. So thank you for that. Um, what we're going to do, Alistair, I'm going to hand over to you to handle this. Um, and then we people can unmute themselves. And I think on the hour, we will then call it a day. Uh, I unfortunately I have people and I'm going to run that way. I've got to intend to them, but not before I have not unmuted Paolo. Paolo, you have to say something. You look Italian, you sound Italian. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe not. <laughs> Who's Paolo? Yes, I, I want to, to thank you, Massimo. To make, uh, he made uh, complex things simple. And uh, I just greet him from Trento because I live in the same town as he does. So uh, thank you again. It was a very interesting talk. And uh, we're all waiting to have a second chance. Wow, fantastic. Th th thank you. Thank you, Paolo. Very kind of you. And uh, yeah, maybe we can have a, we can have a glass of Teroldego one day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.